Is he going to call any rebuttal witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. We propose, <coughs> excuse me, two rebuttal witnesses. One would be Sergeant Griffin to talk about put in context, not in detail, but the fact that this incidents, these incidents that the neighborhoods testified about was an ongoing neighbor dispute. He called on them as much as they called on him. So, and, and, oh, I'm sorry. And the other thing was that when you responded to these calls, did you get both sides where they're differing accounts of what happened? Yeah. So first of all, um, there's a bunch of hearsay that can't come in there. So she wants to call a police officer. She didn't get called to every incident. He only showed up four or five times as the sergeant. So he could have talked about all of the incidents that we have police reports for. The court didn't allow us to have our witnesses talk about the ongoing neighbor dispute. So if the court doesn't allow us to get that testimony out of our witnesses, how is it now appropriate for the state to call Sergeant Griffin uh, to say this was an ongoing neighbor dispute, it went back and forth, sometimes Mr. Ariola called, sometimes the, the neighbors called. If the state gets to do that, we get to put our witnesses back on. They can talk about how they were shot at, how their, how their elderly relatives were called a cunt. You want to get into it? Let's get into it. We weren't able to. Your Honor. <coughs> Sorry. Are we on the record yet? No. Oh. So, <laughs> so I don't think we need to be. No. All right. Well, Your Honor, as I recall, you restricted what they could say pretty pretty well, and um, on on cross, Miss Walker attempted to say, "Was this a dispute between both of you, whatnot?" And we, they denied it. They acted like it was all Mr. Goodyear. You know, I'm not going to allow uh, Officer Griffin to testify on that. It was, it was my, my, my ruling was very limited. It was limited only to show that defendant had Mason use the hammer. That was it. And that's all I allowed. So in terms of the other witness that um, Ms. Romo wants to call, she wants to call Tomlinson who went to the scene, I suspect, for the very first time on October 28, 2022, two and a half years after the incident, took photographs of the scene, which were just provided to us a couple days ago. Even though the pictures were taken on the 28th, I don't think we got them until the 3rd or the 4th. Uh, so that's new evidence that shouldn't come in because it was provided after trial started um, and, and then she wants to ask him questions about when you submit items to the lab for testing, how do you decide what to send? That testimony is already in evidence. He's already testified it, to when he sends things to the lab, what happens. Quite frankly, his testimony is wrong, and his testimony is going to be wrong when he takes the witness stand again. Ms. Uh, Romo, and yeah, we're I, not on the record. I'm sorry? We're not on the record. Okay. Okay, all right. Well, so. Judge, first of all, yes, Frank Tomlinson, Sergeant Griffin, and myself and co-counsel went to the scene in response to their demonstration and their expert's testimony, which was provided late, for the specific purpose of seeing if what he was saying made sense in the parameters, giving everything, the room and whatnot. So as I think it was Ms. Moss who pointed out so eloquently last week, we don't have an obligation to provide demonstrative rebuttal evidence, and that's all this is going to be is demonstrative. Your Honor, there are photographs taken two and a half years later of Tomlinson standing in the room like this trying to demonstrate the size of the room, and you can't even see where this hand is. They didn't even take the pictures right. Not to mention the fact that they're photographing a scene that's two and a half years old. Your Honor. They, they, hang on. They, uh, they, they want to have him show a picture of the mirror that was hanging on the wall. We don't know how that was changed over the last two and a half years. I'm sorry their lead detective didn't go to the scene for two and a half years. This doesn't come in. This is ridiculous. He can't, he can't show a picture and talk about a mirror that was in the room on October 28th, 2022. There's other things he can talk about, Judge. For example, and I asked 
I, don't, I, I know I asked at least two witnesses about that drywall. That drywall, I think one of the experts said, well, it could be firm or it could not be firm. And the point of that is to rebut the testimony that there was a struggle, a struggle in that this little room, and also to rebut the inference that was made yesterday in front of the jury by Ms. Moss that we just made this up, I guess. No, we measured it. It's accurate. And it's relevant to whether there is a struggle in the room. You can push on that drywall, even a little bit, it bends. It's very thin. And the likelihood of a struggle taking place in there. Yeah, but but Ms. Romo, what I'm seeing is this, this is more collateral than rebuttal. How, I don't understand your, what do you mean collateral? You're just adding more, you're not rebutting what they say, you're just adding more to what you, that your, your side brought forth. That's exactly I, I don't, right. I don't even know, for example, I, I, I don't even know, for example, if, if that heater now is back on the wall it where is. it was. It is, the heater is back on the wall. Is it back, is it back on the wall? Yes. We're not going to show it back on the wall, Judge. The heater is back and, and, on the wall. And, hold on, hold on. And, moreover, the point is, the pictures that are in evidence, they can see those pictures and the items that are still there, as in the pictures that were taken in but, 2020. But that's not the question. The question is, my question, for example, that heater, is it still in the very same position it was no. the day of the, uh, no, it's now it's hung up. I'm not showing that heater. It, I'm not of, rebutting that. Of, and of, I'm also, of, another thing I'm gonna rebut, Your Honor, with Mr. Tomlinson or Sergeant Griffin, the defendant got up there and said that bathroom is not right across the front door. It clearly is. And she's already shown a photograph it, to it, demonstrate it, it, that. No. Yes, you have a picture it, in it's the already been, that's, that's been established already. Yes. I'm not going to, this is all collateral and it's changed so much. And, and I'm using the example of the heater in that it was changed since then. What else has changed since then? And this is also in rebuttal to their experts saying that all crime labs can do certain kinds of testing, which is not true. Our crime lab does not do, for example, they don't do residue testing. They don't do chemical testing. Well, who knows that? Does Mr. Tomlinson know that? Yeah. Your Honor, he didn't testify that, that, that all crime labs can do everything. He actually testified that, that the mace, in order to test something for mace, would have to be sent to an outside lab. That's what he testified to. Well, Judge. Now, the states got themselves in a difficult spot because the, the, the ballistics investigation in this case was pitiful, absolutely pitiful. Okay, pitiful. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to allow any of that as, as, as truly rebuttal. It's, it's collateral. It's out. The photos are, are, are Judge, recent. Can we not make an allowance for the fact that they gave it to, they gave it to us at the last freaking minute? We may, went may, out may, the may. same day they gave us their demonstrative evidence to test it. And he's, he's going to testify. He's testi not qualified to test anything. <laughs> he's going to testify about his observations, when? and that testimony will be used but, an argument. Hold on. A testimony of when? He wasn't there until what, recently? October 28th. But, Judge, some things are not going to change. And, and the Oh, we know. Ms. Moss implied that, that John made up was a, an accurate measure from that scene. And what? that's important. That's important in this case, Judge. That room was so small. Well, the, the, then listen, here, here's the problem. The problem with what they're trying to do is this man was out there on I, October okay, I already made my, I'm not going to allow it. It's shown right there how, big, how small that room is. He was, he was out there that. on the 28th. Okay. They could have asked um, him when he was on the witness stand, and they didn't. Because uh, it, because it would, you know, there wouldn't have been, there would have been an objection. Sure, because it, because, it, because excuse me, because it is rebuttal evidence, de, rebuttal demonstrative evidence, which you will know and they will know. I cannot present until it's raised by defense, and it was strictly for rebuttal. And Absolutely they argued not. so eloquently at their motion hearing that they do not have to provide demonstrative evidence, but we did, but we did too. Okay. And they're saying we didn't go out to the 28th. Well, they didn't get to do the last second interview until well, the 28th. But this isn't rebuttal. That's still, the, that's still the baseline problem here, is that this is not rebuttal. And there's no reason at all. I, I'm not going to lie. The other thing, Ms. Romo, did you look at that step-down instruction? Yes, I did. 
Matches and and did you send it to Ms. Morrissey? I don't. I didn't get anything sent from Ms. Roma that I'm aware of. We did. When? When? What are you talking about? Two weeks ago. Oh yes, of course. I have their jury instructions from two weeks ago. I, I thought. I thought I, you were talking about. Are you about comfortable with that step-down instruction? It sort of follows. <coughs> well, let's go through it. I felt. I'll let you guys go through it, and I they give me the instructions. EGI. Exactly, Judge. I read the step-down instruction this morning, and I don't have any concerns about it. Okay, the one we're saying. Well, I'm going to put down the instructions. I'm going to get the instructions together. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to number and get you copies, and then I want to go over them uh, on the record, and then we will read them to the jury and go to closing argument. All right. All right.
may be seated. We're on the record. Uh, Council, I've handed out a set of jury instructions. Does the state have any objection to either content or the order of the jury instructions? No, Your Honor. Uh, defense, same question. No, Your Honor. Uh, approach the bench for a second. Well, you may be seated. Okay, ladies and gentlemen uh, uh, of the jury, what, what we're going to do is I want to read you closing instructions and the, the lawyers will give you the, the, the closing closing statement. But I, I need to ask, uh, how many of you, of you still need to go vote? All right, so, 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 I, so I, can, I can plan accordingly to this afternoon, okay? Because uh, you certainly will be allowed, you, we'll, we'll, cut, uh, we'll go early if we have to, if you haven't reached a, a, a verdict, we'll do what we need to do so you folks can go vote, all right? All right. And Lieutenant Thomason is zip tying the rifle. I'll, I'll, I'll let him get done, then I'll read you the instructions. Take your time, Lieutenant. I'm going to read you some instructions, but you will get a copy of them. You have heard all the evidence. It is now my duty to tell you the law that you must follow in this case. The law governing this case is contained in instructions that I am about to give you. It is your duty to follow the laws contained in these instructions. You must consider these instructions as a whole. You must not pick out one instruction or parts of an instruction and disregard others. A copy of these instructions will be given to you when you begin your deliberations. 
The law presumes the defendant to be innocent unless and until you're satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of his guilt. The burden is always on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not required that the state prove guilt beyond all possible doubt. The test is one of reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is doubt, is doubt based upon reason and common sense. The kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act in the graver and more important affairs of life. You are the sole judges of the facts in this case. It is your duty to determine the facts from the evidence produced here in court. Your verdict should not be based on speculation, guess, or conjecture. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence your verdict. You are to apply the law as stated in these instructions to the facts as you find them and in this way decide the case. You alone are the judges of the, of the credibility of the witnesses and the way to be given to the testimony of each of them. In determining the credit to be given any witness, you should take into account the witness's truthfulness or untruthfulness, ability and opportunity to observe, memory, manner, manner while testifying, any interest, bias, or prejudice the witness may have, and the reasonableness of the witness's testimony considered in light of all the evidence in the case. You should consider each opinion received in evidence in this case and give it such weight as you think it deserves. If you should conclude that the reasons given in support of the opinion are not sound or that for any other reason the opinion is incorrect or not correct, you may disregard the opinion entirely. An expert witness is a witness who, by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education, has become an expert in any subject. An expert witness may be permitted to state an opinion as to that subject. You should consider each expert opinion and, and the reasons stated for the opinion, giving them such weight as you think they deserve. You may reject an opinion entirely if you conclude it is unsound. In this case, as to the charge of murder in the second degree contained in count one, there are four possible verdicts as to the defendant, Dean Cummings. One. Guilty of second degree murder. Two, not guilty of second degree murder. Three, guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Four, not guilty of voluntary manslaughter. You must consider each of these crimes. You should be sure that you fully understand the elements of each crime before you deliberate further. You have the, you have the discretion to choose the manner and order in which you deliberate on this count, but you must return a unanimous verdict of not guilty on second degree murder before entering a verdict on voluntary manslaughter. You will first decide whether the defendant is guilty of the crime of second degree murder. If you unan unanimously find the defendant guilty of second degree murder, then that is the only form of verdict which is to be signed as to this count. If you unanimously find defendant not guilty of second degree murder, then you should sign the the not guilty form as to second degree, degree murder. If after reasonable deliberation you, should, you, you do not reach a unanimous verdict on second degree murder, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime and you should not proceed to reach a verdict on the remaining crime of voluntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find a verdict of not guilty on second, de second degree murder, you will then go on to the consideration of the crime of voluntary manslaughter. If you unanimously find the defendant guilty of voluntary manslaughter, then that is the only form of verdict that should be signed. But if you unanimously find the defendant not guilty of the crime of voluntary manslaughter, then you should only sign the not guilty form. If after reasonable deliberation you do not reach a unanimous verdict on, not, on voluntary manslaughter, you should not sign a verdict form for that crime. You may not find the defendant guilty of more than one of the foregoing crimes. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendant has committed any one of the crime, you, should, you must determine the defendant is not guilty of that crime. If you find the defendant not guilty of all of these crimes in count one, you must return a verdict of not guilty as to this count. For you to find the defendant guilty of second degree murders charged in count one, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. The defendant killed Guillermo Ariola. The defendant knew that his acts created a strong probability of death or great bodily harm to Guillermo Ariola. The defendant did not act as a result of sufficient provocation. The defendant did not act in self-defense. 
This happened in New Mexico on or about the 29th day of February of the year 2020. For you to find the defendant guilty of voluntary manslaughter as charged in count one, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt each of the following elements of the crime. The defendant killed Guillermo Ariola. The defendant knew that his acts created a strong probability of death or great bodily harm to Guillermo Ariola. The defendant acted as a result of sufficient provocation. The defendant did not act in self-defense. This happened in New Mexico on about the 29th day of February 2020. The difference between second-degree murder and voluntary manslaughter is sufficient provocation. In second-degree murder, the defendant kills without having been sufficiently provoked, that is, without sufficient provocation. In the case of voluntary manslaughter, the defendant kills after being sufficiently provoked, that is, as a result of sufficient provocation. Sufficient provocation reduces second-degree murder to voluntary manslaughter. In addition to the other elements of second-degree murder or voluntary manslaughter, the state must prove to your satisfaction beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant acted intentionally when he committed the crime. A person acts intentionally when he purposely does an act that the law declares to be a crime. Whether the defendant acted intentionally may be inferred from all of the surrounding circumstances, such as the manner in which he acts, the means used, his conduct, and any statements made by him. Sufficient provocation can be any action, conduct, or circumstance which arouse anger, sudden resentment, terror, or extreme emotions. The provocation must be such as would affect the ability to reason or to cause a temporary loss of self-control in an ordinary person of average disposition. The provocation is not sufficient for an, for an ordinary person would have, the provocation is not sufficient if an ordinary person would have cooled off before acting. Great bodily harm means an injury to a person which creates a high probability of death or serious, or results in serious disfigurement or results in the loss of any member or organ of the body or results in permanent or prolonged impairment of the use of any member or organ of the body. An issue you must consider in this case is whether the defendant killed Guillermo Areola in self-defense. The killing is in self-defense if, one, there was an apparent or immediate danger of death or great bodily harm to the defendant as a result of Guillermo Ariola attacking Dean Cummings. Two, the defendant was in fact put in fear by the apparent danger of immediate death or great bodily harm and killed Guillermo Ariola because of that fear. And three, a reasonable, per a reasonable person in the same circumstances as the defendant would have acted as the defendant did. The burden is on the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act in self-defense. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendant acted in self-defense, you must find the defendant not guilty. A person who is d defending against an attack, defending another from an attack, or defending property need not retreat. In the exercise of the right of self-defense, a person must stand, may stand the person's ground and defend himself. Your verdict must represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, it is necessary that each juror agrees. Your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty to consult one another and try to reach an agreement. However, you are not required to give up your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but you must do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with your fellow jurors. In the course of your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your own view and change your opinion if you are convinced it is erroneous. But do not surrender your honest conviction as to the weight or effect of the evidence solely because of the opinion of your fellow jurors or for the purpose of reaching a verdict. You are the judges, judges of the facts. Your sole interest is to ascertain the truth from the evidence in this case. You must not concern yourself with the consequences of your verdict. Now the lawyers will argue the case. What is said in argument is not evidence. It is the opportunity for the lawyers to discuss the evidence and the law as I have instructed you. The state has the right to argue first. The defense may then argue. The state may then, may then reply. State, you may. You need it.
do that. Good. Thank you for your time and attention, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a long seven days, I think, that we've been able to um, all be in this courtroom together. So I thank you for your time and attention in this case. On February 29th of 2020, the defendant, Mr. Cummings, shot and killed Guillermo Adiola at his ranch in Sandoval County. As I said at the beginning in opening statements, we know who did this and we know how he did it. And so you are the finders of facts. It's your job to determine whether or not this crime was committed with sufficient provocation, making it a voluntary manslaughter, or without sufficient provocation, making it a second degree murder. Or did he commit this homicide in self-defense? This is your job to determine this. The state has presented all of its evidence and the defendant has presented his evidence. We know that Mr. Cummings shot Mr. Adiola with this AR-15 AR like rifle with a 30 round magazine by shooting him twice, once in the head and once in the chest. What weapon was used is not an issue. What magazine was used is not an issue. Why this is done, this is what you're asked to determine. And the state is gonna, has presented evidence to you that Mr. Adiolo was not armed. The force that was used was not reasonable. As I said in the beginning of this case, this case is about reasonableness. And you ladies and gentlemen determine what is reasonable here. As I said, the, the judges gave you instructions on what the law is. Second degree murder is not an act as a result of sufficient provocation. Voluntary manslaughter is when someone does act as a result of sufficient provocation. So the only difference is that number three for you to decide. So what is sufficient provocation? You're gonna have the instructions that the judge read to you. You'll have those to look at, to read, to think about. Would an ordinary person of an average disposition have done the same as Mr. Cummings did? It's not sufficient if someone would have cooled off before acting. Would an average person have walked out of the trailer, cooled off? If Mr. Adiola was acting crazy and aggressive, was that sufficient provocation? Would Mr. Ali Ola have walked off? As I said, this is a case about reasonableness and you determine what was reasonable on that day. So let's talk about the evidence in this case. <coughs> Mr. Cummings was gonna purchase this ranch out in Sandoval County for Mr. Adiola. Ms. Landers drew up that real estate contract. She's known Mr. Adiola for about 20 years. He was gonna buy it for 149,000 and Mr. Adiola let him park his fifth wheel trailer out there for $300 a month. Ms. Landers told you she thought that Mr. Cummings was taking advantage of him, that this wasn't a fair deal. She said that Mr. Adiola liked Mr. Cummings and they got along well when she saw them together. She thought that Mr. Cummings also liked Mr. Adiola as well. They were friends. Mr. Adiola had even given Mr. Cummings a horse. She said that she thought Mr. Cummings was kind of strange and something was off about him. They did not yet have an executed contract to purchase that land. Mr. Cummings told you when he took the witness stand that he also thought he got along good with Mr. Adiola. They had a lot in common. They hung out, they drank whiskey, they went horseback riding together. They got along just fine. Mr. Cummings testified that Mr. Adiola told him about an incident with a hammer. He said that Mr. Adiola had told him that he had scared a guy by hitting a car with a hammer. And he thought hearing that story made him think, well, I better be careful. And this is a man who took the stand and told you about his vertical gains and he made a living as a world-class skier. He told you he took multiple helicopter runs up an amazing big mountain and that this dangerous career of his required technique and athleticism. 
but he thought I should be careful because an old man told me a story that happened years ago about a hammer. Is that reasonable? Mr. Cummings testified that he arrived at Mr. Audiola's trailer at about 10 or 11 p.m. the night before. He said that he was watching a movie and he dozed off. He thought that he smelled propane and so he went to his fifth wheel trailer. Mr. Audiola arrives at the ranch the next day, February 29th, 2020, leap day. Mr. Cummings said that he believes Mr. Audiola arrived at 1.32 p.m., broad daylight. Remember, this area is so remote. Mr. Cummings could see him coming from a distance. This area is so remote, he would have heard a large truck approaching this ranch in the middle of nowhere. He had time to prepare his attack. Mr. Cummings testified about what happened that day. He told you, ladies and gentlemen, that he was in the kitchen and Mr. Audiola was unloading groceries with a scowl on his face. They talked for eight to 10 minutes, is what he told you. And that because he called Mr. Audiola a scammer, that made Mr. Audiola so mad that he attacked him out of nowhere, just for being called a scammer. Mind you, Ms. Landers believed that the contract was in Mr. Cummings' benefit. He was gonna live there for $300 a month, had full access to that land, was given a horse for $300 a month. Mr. Cummings told you that he was slammed <coughs> into the counter and fell to the ground. And he grabbed his rifle from the wall and crab walked down the hallway while well, Mr. Audiola is swinging at him, not hitting him, but swinging at him. I, at the beginning of this trial, ladies and gentlemen, I told you that Mr. Audiola can't tell us what happened that day. The evidence will show what happened that day. And is it reasonable to believe that Mr. Audiola, because he was called a scammer, would attack Mr. Cummings, this professional athlete, This is a case of reasonableness. Or is it more reasonable to believe that Mr. Cummings made up this story to cover what he did? You're the, you're the judges of the credibility of the witnesses. You saw every witness take that stand. You saw all of the evidence admitted. You determine who to believe. You determine what's true on that witness stand. You heard a story of Mr. Cummings and how what he told you contradicted every witness that took that stand. It contradicted what Mr. McCullough said happened, what Ms. Landers said would happen, what the responding deputy said would happen, what's recorded on the ballot tape of the responding deputies, what the 911 calls say, he disagrees, even his own expert. His testimony even contradicted his own expert. We know Mr. Cummings shot and killed Mr. Audiola. He doesn't immediately run out and go get help. He doesn't think, hey, I need to call an ambulance. No, he said, I gotta go wash my face and hands. And I gotta go back and I gotta get soap. And I gotta go back out and wash my hands. He changes his clothing. He walks around the ranch. He even said that he's medically trained. And he walked over, peeked in the window and saw that Mr. Audiola wasn't breathing. His chest wasn't moving his way but he was lying face down. Mr. Cummings told you, ladies and gentlemen, that at about 3, 3.30 p.m., he is the time he believes he was washing his hands off his face, changing clothes. So if Mr. Audiola arrived at the ranch at 1.30, what did he do between 1.30 and 3.30? That's two hours of unaccounted time for. Mr. McCullough, called 911 at 5.30. What happened between 3.30 and 5.30? That's four hours of unaccounted time for. Let's talk about Mr. McCullough. Mr. McCullough testified that he was out riding his dirt bike out at Cabazon Peak. He said that he was driving at a Y intersection. He went to the right until the road ended and he saw a male walking around outside by some structures. He said he couldn't 
quite look at the male, so he, because he was trying to keep his bike on the road, and so he turned around and went back to that Cabazon Peak point of interest sign that he wanted to read. He said that Mr. Cummings came up to him while he was at this sign, and he starts talking to him about motorcycles. I like the motorcycle, telling him how he likes motorcycles. And they have this friendly conversation with a stranger about outdoor sports. He doesn't say, I need help or anything of that nature. Can you call 911? No. He's like, hey, let's talk about motorcycles. That goes to the reasonableness of his actions on that day. Mr. Cummings then drives off, not to get help, not to get cell phone service, which is four miles from the ranch. And then he decides, you know what? Mr. McCullough is going to be a good witness for him. So he drives back, talks to Mr. McCullough again some more. They're chit-chatting. And then when Mr. McCullough goes to leave is when he waves him back over and says, he says, I'm in a little bit of trouble and I need help. When Mr. Cummings took the stand, he denied that he ever left and came back. His story contradicts Mr. McCullough. So you judge the credibility of the witnesses. Mr. Cummings, Mr. McCullough testified that the defendant told him he needs help. Not Mr. Adiola needs help. Mr. Cummings needs help. He tells Mr. McCullough that he was sprayed with a poison. He never said mace. He never said I was in a fight for my life with his gun. He said I was sprayed with a poison. And the poison burned his skin and his face and made it difficult for him to breathe. Mr. McCullough sees no injuries. He said he didn't see anything on Mr. Cummings that night. He never told any witness that he was in a fight, that he was in a battle for his life with that gun. Not law enforcement, not Mr. McCullough, nobody. He said that he was sprayed with poison. That is the one consistent thing he tells all of the witnesses. And that is the one thing he's holding on to. He wants to make sure that everybody is a witness to this can. Everyone needs to see that Mr. Adiola had this in his hand. And I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, to fill this. Hold it. So Mr. McCullough pulls out his cell phone, calls 911. And you have the 911 calls and evidence, and I urge you to listen to them. You can hear in the fourth audio, Mr. Cummings is talking in the background. You can hear in the audio, on the first and second calls, he's talking to a friend. He's not calling the 911 operator. You can hear him in the fourth audio call, calling the 911 operator. So in calls one and two, he's chatting with a friend. You can hear him in that call, telling this friend that he doesn't feel too good in his whole life, his whole left side. Something about his whole left side. But he testified that his right side was straight to you, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Cummings didn't call law enforcement until 13 minutes after Mr. McCullough did. You heard Mr. Cummings testify that um, he was 10 feet away from the truck. Mr. McCullough was 10 feet away from the truck. He wasn't asking him any questions about where the gun is and if anyone needs help. But you can hear the calls and you can hear those questions he asked. But that's what Mr. Cummings told you, ladies and gentlemen. He said that he called his dad. And Mr. McCullough described the demeanor of Mr. Cummings on that night as calm, not at all frantic or upset. Is that reasonable? He just shot and killed a man and is hanging out with a stranger talking about motorcycles. Is that reasonable? Mr. Cummings tells Mr. McCullough that he washed his fan hands, changed his clothes, washed his face, and that the gun is in the back of his truck. And he told you a different story. He said that he immediately put that gun against the porch. So again, his testimony contradicts what Mr. McCullough said. Mr. Cummings asked Mr. McCullough to be his witness that the guy attacked him. And Mr. McCullough told you, ladies and gentlemen, how could I do that? I wasn't a witness to anything like that. I wasn't there. 
Mr. McCullough follows Mr. Cummings back to the ranch to see if he could render any aid. But the, Mr. Adiolo was past the point of aid. He said he was bluish or grayish. But he wanted to make sure that Mr. McCullough saw what was in Mr. Adiolo's right hand. You heard Mr. McCullough say that Mr. Cummings really wanted him to see that black canister because he wanted to make sure that he had a witness that Mr. Aliola had attacked him with the black canister. Mr. Cummings was obsessed with showing everyone that Mr. Aliola had a can of poison. He needed a witness to this poison. And again, he never told anybody there was a struggle. He needed a witness to this. This was his focus. Mr. McCullough was the first person in that trailer after the homicide. He smelled nothing, no poison, no neurological agent, no mace. Mr. Cummings made this whole thing up to justify what he did. And you can see in that photo that can is facing Mr. Adiola. Mr. McCullough goes to Cabazon Peak to wait to law enforcement. And he said that he took out his ID because he knew that law enforcement would want it. So he was there waiting for law enforcement to lead him back to the ranch. Mr. McCullough's call was at 531. Law enforcement is dispatched at 540. And Sergeant Crispin testified that they met with the calling party, Mr. McCullough, at 626 p.m. Again, more time. Mr. McCullough isn't there, and Mr. Cummings isn't there. He's back at the ranch. There's more time there. Law enforcement goes to the ranch and they encounter Mr. Cummings at his truck at the exit. And he tells law enforcement as soon as they come upon him, self-defense, self-defense. He says that he was harmed by a neurological agent. And you can listen to Deputy Walker's belt tape. You can hear him say neuro he was harmed by a neurological agent. He told Deputy Walker that it must have been chlorophyll. And Deputy Walker testified that he didn't see any injuries on Mr. Cummings. He had no symptoms that he would expect to see of somebody who has been sprayed by a neurological agent or mace. No red eyes, no red skin, no rash, nothing of that nature. Listen to this belt tape. There's no panic in Mr. Cummings' voice. He's not frantic in any way. He doesn't ever say he's in a fight for his life. They do a protective sweep of the residence and he said Sergeant Crispin hung out at the car with Mr. Cummings. And Sergeant Crispin testified that he had been asking Mr. Cummings for his name and his date of birth for about three hours. And all he would say is Dean, Dean. And you heard they don't have radio dispatch out there. They're not getting the calls from dispatch that Mr. Cummings had called in. They have to drive four miles down the road to get radio service, to get cell service. They're not leaving the ranch. They're there to secure the scene. Even on Deputy Walker's belt tape, towards the end, you can hear the defendant tell the de deputies, did you see the device in his hand? Did you see the device in his hand? He wants to make sure everyone's a witness to the device. You heard testimony that Deputy Gutierrez and Sergeant Griffin arrive on scene as well at about 7.30 p.m. Mr. Cummings is evaluated by EMS and released. He's not transported for any injuries from the poison or the chlorophyll or the neurological agent. They take photos of him. There's no injuries on his person that are documented in these photos. There's no rash, no redness, no bruising, no scratches from a fight for his life. Nothing indicative of a fight is on his body. His knuckles don't have injuries from being in a, a fight, a physical altercation. He didn't tell anybody he had any burns on his hands. Even the expert witness couldn't say what was on his hands other than there's black smudge on his hands. Nobody knows what that is. 
He could have touched anything in the hours he had from the time he killed Mr. Adiola to the time these photos are taken. While he's being photographed by law enforcement, he tells them that, yeah, he washed off with a hose outside after being sprayed with the neurological agent. He says his clothes are in the back of the truck. Sergeant Griffin testified that they were wet when they collected the clothes. And you can see the clothes there in evidence. The t-shirt clearly looks like it was folded up when it was wet. Got the wrinkled marks on it. Sergeant Griffin said he smelled nothing on the clothes he collected. New Mexico State Police arrived to process the scene. You heard from Agent Carlos Herrera, Agent Bogue did the diagrams of the scene, and Edgar, Agent Edgar Lemus collect, helped collected evidence and took photographs. Agent Herrera stated that he collected 11 spent casings from that bedroom. Now think about that, 11 spent casings. That means that Mr. Cummings shot that rifle approximately 11 times in that little bedroom. Now we heard testimony about two to the body and one graze the clothes and three through the door. That's not all 11. Mr. Audiola didn't have a chance. He was unarmed and he had an AR-like rifle and 11 <clears throat> spent casings. Not one shot, two shots, three shots, four shots, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You heard testimony that the majority of the casings were on the side of the room with the wall. So if the shooter was looking towards the door, these casings are expelling from the firearm to the right. And the majority of the casings are along that wall there. So the shooter must have been facing the door if the casings are popping out that way. One casing was on the other side of the room. There's even a casing on that plastic tote. So we know the plastic tote was there. So number three on the evidence tag, that's the casing on the other side of the room. There was only one. If the rifle expels these spent casings from the right side of the gun from the shooter, then we know that the majority of the shots were faced, shot facing towards the door. If the gun was upside down, like the expert said it potentially could have been, then the casings would have expelled the opposite direction. And we have one spent casing on that side. And you heard they can move around, but the majority are on the right, on the other side of Mr. Adiola's body. You saw Mr. Cummings' reenactment of what he believed happened that day. He said that he shot two times into the ground. And we heard testimony about the muzzle patterns. And, but when Mr. Cummings came and did his reenactment of what he believed in this small room, and he did it with that little blue gun, he pointed it directly at the ground. He never, in his reenactment, ever, ever said the gun was up there. That's different than what his expert said. More casings, casings. Let's talk about the rest of the residence. This is the door outside to go outside, right directly across from the bathroom. You heard Mr. Cummings tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that yes, he went into the bathroom um, and that he was able to, at that point, when he was in the bathroom, Make the rifle ready, chambered around. This takes affirmative effort to do that. And he's going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that after he chambered around, Mr. Arbillo completed 
directly turn around right outside that door and go out the porch. What's reasonable, ladies and gentlemen? He could have went to the kitchen, gone out the other door, out the other side. What about the rest of the residents? There's no signs of a struggle. The only one who says there's a struggle is Mr. Cummings. None of the evidence shows that. There's no signs of fight. There's the other door. The kitchen has no signs of a fight. Nothing is broken, no broken dishes. If you're a parent, you know not to leave a pot with the handle out. That wasn't disturbed. Nothing on the counter. We see the sunglasses. Supposedly they're Mr. Adiola's sunglasses on the ground. That's the only thing out of place in this room. So what's reasonable? If there was a fight and Mr. Cummings said he was slammed into the counter, nothing is disturbed on the counter. He was slammed into this counter. Those cans are still on the edge. Nothing is disturbed on that counter where he was allegedly slammed into. In the bedroom, there was this big fight in the bedroom. You have clothing on the wall. This is a manufactured home, a mobile home. The walls aren't the strongest. If you've ever been in a manufactured home, you know that they, you can push them, they're flexible. There's a hat hanging on the coat rack and that mirror is perched against the wall there. Mr. Cummings testified that he believed that the heater was on the wall. There's no scratches on that wall. If they were in this big battle for their life and they knocked over that heater, wouldn't the wall be scratched from the heater being knocked over? There's no physical evidence of a fight. On the other side of the room, clothes are hanging still. Not a little bit of clothes, it looks like a lot of clothes on that hanger. The lid of that plastic bin is precariously open. That wasn't disturbed either. Now, let's talk about this photo. You heard Mr. Brudenell, <coughs> the expert, testify that the shooter must have been either between the two beds, the bunk bed and the other bed, or over by that wall. So he said that the shooter must have been here. Or here. Not a lot of space. But this is our room here. And we have two beds. A bunk bed here and a bed here. There's not a lot of space. There was a struggle. That stuff would have been disturbed. Something would have been knocked over. The expert testified that Mr. Adiola must have been parallel to the floor. He could have been on all fours. That's a vulnerable position. He's not fighting anybody on all fours. But the wounds show him. He's a shot right in the middle of the leg. And he's got his hands on the Or he could have been bent over. Again, that's a vulnerable position. You're not fighting someone if you're bent over and they have a rifle pointing at you. Mr. Brudenell says that and Olamai says that. They both said the same thing. The machinist could have been on all fours or was bent over. That's what the evidence shows. The defendant in his reenactment to you, ladies and gentlemen, he said that Mr. Audiola was coming at him, and he was crab walking, holding the gun, fighting him off. He was crab walking, he was fighting him off, and he's going on the ground. And in his reenactment, he said that Mr. 
The shooter was above the person being shot. That's a vulnerable position. Let's talk about the mace. No witness ever said the mace was sprayed. Mr. Cummings said maybe, he was kind of unsure, and on, on redirect then he said it was sprayed. He's the only one who said that. This is a self-serving statement. There's no physical evidence to support this. Mr. Cummings didn't even call it mace. He called it a neurological agent or chlorophyll or poison. Law enforcement testified that they've been sprayed. They do this as part of their job and training, that it could last anywhere from 45 minutes to two days. And you heard a lot of this in Bois Dyer. It gets on your clothing. <coughs> and they also said that an excess will drip out when it's sprayed. <coughs> There's no excess. Not on Mr. Adiola's hand and not on the floor. It has a distinct smell. And water could reactivate it. Mr. Cummings said he washed off with the hose spigot. He's just spreading it. When you put water, it just spreads it to other parts. He said he used soap and washed more. You heard testimony that Mr. Adiola was known to carry mace with a dye. It's probably not the same can of mace from that 2017 incident. He probably got another can. There's no red dye in that room. And you can look at the can of mace. It appears that there's a red dye, and I refer to you. Look at it. There's dirt in there. This hasn't been used. <coughs> Mr. Cummings set up this scene so that he can claim self-defense to justify his unreasonable actions. Mr. Audiola was not armed. This can is facing the wrong way. And in order to util utilize this can, you have to lift up the top and then spray. There's no way he could do that from that position it's in his hand. No one falls over with something in your hand. If you're going to fall, you're going to fall with your hands out to brace your fall. You're not going to fall with something in your hand. If someone is shot, they likely grab whatever area they're shot at and they go forward. If Mr. Adiola was shot to the head first, you heard, oh am I, that that would have been an instant kill. He wouldn't have survived much longer after that. If he was shot to the head first, he would have been fallen face first and not likely to hold anything in his hand. Let's talk about Dr. Gerald, the OMI doctor. She said that Mr. Adiola was five foot nine, 199 pounds. And he's supposedly in this fight for his life with a professional athlete. <clears throat> Mr. Adiola had two gunshot wounds. The first one she talked about entered at the right temple, went through the oral cavity of the neck, broke three cervical verte vertebrae, and left fragments in the chest. And the second shot, she said was to the super clavicle region, I'm not good with the science terms, um, and it exited out the other side of his chest. The first one was, she said, an intermediate range, and the second one was a distant range. Dr. Gerald said that those injuries were from right to left in a downward trajectory. The shooter was above Mr. Audiola. She said Mr. Audiola could have been kneeling other than the injury to Mr. Audiola, he had an injury to his nose. He had some bruising she could not age, I believe she said on the back of one of the thighs. And you have the body diagram. But other than that, he had no scrapes. He had no injuries from this fight. His knuckles aren't damaged from a fight. There's no scratches, there's no abrasions. Nothing of that nature. He has no burns on his hand from supposedly grabbing a hot barrel. The expert said that the rifle barrel, when it's shot, it's a ball of gas essentially coming out, and it would have been hot. 
You also heard from Dr. Gerald about the toxicology, that Mr. Adiola had cocaine, alcohol, and marijuana. There's no information. She couldn't tell you how that would affect Mr. Adiola particularly. She just said it could cause aggressiveness and it could cause risk taking, but she couldn't say how it affects one particular person. And she admitted she has no knowledge of how the testing process goes and she was just reading what potentially could happen to someone from a piece of paper. They collected a straw, a pen, and papers. Again, this stuff wasn't tested. There's no evidence. You heard that it may be consistent with drug use. Let's talk about the DNA. Jennifer Otto of the New Mexico Department of Public Safety Lab, she did serology testing. That's testing of the bodily fluids. And she said that the clothing Mr. Cummings wore was tested. His clothing that he said he wore at the time of this that was wet when it was collected had no blood on it. So that means that he was standing far enough away from Mr. Adiola when he shot him that there wasn't even any blood on his clothing. Let's talk about the DNA testing she did. She said that she tested the rifle and Mr. Cummings' DNA could not be eliminated. But there was a mixture there. So he could potentially be there. But Mr. Adiola was eliminated as a contributor to the DNA. And you heard about the different areas of the gun that were tested. And you saw the reenactment from Mr. Cummings when he said, yes, Mr. Adiola was grabbing everywhere all over the gun. <clears throat> The mace cam. There's two DNA contributors on the mace cam. Mr. Audiolo was the major DNA contributor, and Mr. Cummings was eliminated. If Mr. Cummings had time to set up the scene, he could have wiped the cam like you see in movies and then put it in his hand. Just the way he wanted everyone to witness the cam in the hand. They took swabs for Mr. Cummings' face and hands. There were two contributors. Mr. Cummings' DNA was there. Obviously, it's his body, his swab. That's not a surprise. But Mr. Adiola was eliminated. This was a physical fight. Mr. Adiola's DNA would have been on his face or his hands if they're fighting for the gun. They also took, tested the fingernail clippings for Mr. Adiola. And there was no DNA foreign to Mr. Adiola. So that means Mr. Cummings' DNA wasn't underneath his fingernails. So it's not a fight. That's not a, that's not a surprise. <clears throat> Let's talk about Lieutenant Tomlinson. He testified about the limitations of their radios and the CAD system and the body-worn cameras and belt tapes and that Sandoval County is the largest geographical county and they typically on a normal shift have four to five deputies for this huge county to cover on every shift. You heard him say that he testified at grand jury on March 19th, 2020, and he was asked on cross-examination, how can you say that drugs and alcohol were not an issue when he was asked this at, on cross-examination? And you heard him. This grand jury was on March 19th. He didn't have toxicology. He didn't know. He can't say that it was. He didn't have that information. He didn't have Agent Herrera's report. Agent Herrera's report didn't come out until April 7th. And Lieutenant Tomlinson also testified that he believed Mr. Adiola entered the room, bent and turned the other direction, entered the room, bent from the other direction and went to leave, and that's why the body landed in the position that it landed. Because of momentum. He also testified that Mr. Cummings also had marijuana. And he was in the presence of Mr. Cummings for six hours, and he also saw no injuries. You also have to determine that this wasn't self-defense. And the evidence shows that this was not self-defense. The only one who says it's self-defense is Mr. Cummings, who wants everyone to witness the can. You saw some photos about splotches on a gun. 
Agent Herrera said it could be stip stippling, stipling, gun residue. It could be cleaning oil, Agent Herrera said. The expert said it could be cleaning oil. Sergeant Griffin said it could be cleaning oil. If the defendant had just taped on the scope with electrical tape, he could have cleaned the gun. There's no evidence whatsoever what those splotches are. Even the mace. There's no evidence it was ever sprayed. The self-defense instruction says that you need to determine whether or not there is an appearance of immediate danger of death. Does this give the appearance of an immediate <clears throat> danger of death or great bodily harm? Would a reasonable person believe you're in immediate danger of death? The muzzle patterns, you heard the um, expert testify, they can't be aged. He, there's no way for him to tell if they were hours apart, days apart. If Mr. Cummings had time to put this in Mr. Adiola's hand, he had time to put those marks in the ground. There was hours unaccounted for. He didn't go get help. He didn't drive four miles down the road to get cell phone service. He was there for hours. Mr. Cummings, when he testified, he showed you his reenactment. This is how small the room is. Nothing's disturbed in that small room. He said he was crab walking. He said that he was pulling Mr. Adiola by his jacket. Mr. Adiola doesn't have a jacket. There's no jacket collected. No jacket was ever mentioned until Mr. Cummings said that. Mr. Cummings said that Mr. Adiola pulled the, the barrel of the gun against his trigger finger. How reasonable is that? If Mr. Adiola is pulling the gun by the barrel against his trigger finger, he would have burns on his hand. His hand would have been shot. How reasonable is Mr. Cummings' story that someone's gonna pull the gun against your trigger finger? This story's not reasonable. His story. It's a self-serving statement made up to justify what he did and you determine the credibility of the witnesses. His story contradicts everything that every other witness said, <clears throat> every piece of audio we have. This is not self-defense. It requires that he was in fact put in fear by the apparent danger of immediate death or great bodily harm. And Mace is not that. There's no immediate death. There's no great bodily harm. His actions weren't reasonable. And we would ask that you find him guilty of the second degree murder because he was not provoked. Mr. Adiola was unarmed when he shot and killed him. Or the lesser included offense if you think he was sufficiently provoked of voluntary manslaughter. Thank you. Defense. Counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's almost like the prosecutor was watching a different trial than the rest of us. Because the state's case, after all of this evidence has been presented, boils down to a bunch of could haves, hypothetical scenarios, and excuses. Excuses for why they didn't do the criminal investigation that should have been done in this case. The type of criminal investigation that the state has an obligation to do. Because the state, the law enforcement agencies, and we've got two of them in this case. We've got the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office, and we have the New Mexico State Police. Two agencies that could have and should have done a thorough 
unbiased investigation. And instead, what we have is this half-hearted, sloppy, I'm sorry to say it, sloppy, incomplete investigation. And now the state's asking you to prosecute and convict Mr. Cummings of murder? Let's talk about what the evidence actually showed in this case. The evidence that you saw during this trial. The state started its case with Officer Walker. Officer Walker, who seems like a nice enough guy, but he had spent his entire law enforcement career skipping from one agency to another, to another, to another, until now he's not even in law enforcement anymore. Officer Walker was, sounds like the first person who had contact with Mr. Cummings that day when the police finally arrived on scene, took him a while to get there. Mr. Cummings waiting patiently for them to arrive. And Officer Walker testified on direct examination that Mr. Cummings refused to provide his name and that he had asked Mr. Cummings his name and he wouldn't tell him. As you may recall, my co-counsel asked him to listen to his entire belt tape. We took a break for the night, at which time he did. And then he had to come back into court and he had to tell you, he had to admit that his statements were not true. He actually never did ask Mr. Cummings his name. So that's our first state's witness. He also denied that Mr. Cummings ever said, I'm devastated. Denied that he ever said that. And my co-counsel, again, had to play his recording back to him so he could listen to it, and you could all listen to it again, when it is as clear as day that one of the first things that Mr. Cummings said to those law enforcement officers is, I'm devastated. And yet, the state wants to spin it like he was having no emotions at all that day. The state ignores the fact that during the 911 call made by Mr. McCullough, Mr. McCullough actually says that Mr. Cummings seems pretty shook up. It's in the 911 calls. You have them. If you want to listen to him during deliberations, you may do so. So even Mr. McCullough says he seemed shook up, and then he describes himself as devastated. But I'll give Officer Walker credit. At least he was running his belt tape. At least he was running that recording device. Because in this case, I think it's become really clear why it's so important that law enforcement have recording devices whenever they interact with the public. It's so important because just with Officer Walker, we saw all these numerous inconsistencies and inaccuracies in his testimony that he had to be confronted with using his belt tape. And so at least he was running it. Now another law enforcement officer ran a recording device out at the scene. Officer Crespin says he was running his lapel camera. He says that he was running it and he made multiple videos throughout the, his investigation that day. And yet somehow, oddly enough, that is the one case where his videos disappeared. He told you about how he would download all of his videos once a week. And he admitted that all of the videos from that week that included February 29th, all of the other videos from all of his other calls that week were downloaded. Crazy. All of the videos just for Mr. Cummings' case disappear. No explanation for that, and I don't have an explanation for that. Either he was not telling the truth when he said he was running his camera, or they were destroyed or lost. Officer Crespin is also the officer who doesn't even know what time the sun sets. He couldn't even tell us accurately when the sun had set the day before. And so the state wants you to take his testimony and believe that he actually was interrogating Mr. Cummings and asked him for three hours what his name was and that he didn't know his identity despite the fact that Mr. Cummings had actually called 911, had given his name, had given his phone number, and told the 911 operator, I have been attacked. 
attacked. Where's the 911 call Mr. Cummings made? Why do we have four 911 calls from Mr. McCullough and we don't have his? We don't have Mr. Cummings. Objection, Your Honor. We approach. As I was saying, the state never even obtained Mr. Cummings' 911 call. Why not? They can clearly get 911 calls because they got Mr. McCullough's. Why not get his? Then moving on to Sergeant Griffin. Sergeant Griffin was the investigator at the scene responsible over the investigation of the ranch. Sergeant Griffin came in here, ladies and gentlemen, and told you this was the magazine recovered from the sea, and these were the casings recovered from the sea. Their lead investigator on the sea tells you this. It's not a big mystery that this is not the right magazine. This is the right magazine. Why do we have two magazines? The state doesn't even know what their evidence is, and we don't know where this stuff comes from. Your Honor, may I, I'm going to approach. I'm sorry, but this is really unfair and prejudicial. Sergeant Griffin also testified that Mr. Cummings told him where his clothes were located, told him he had been attacked and sprayed with some kind of a chemical, and asked him to tag those pieces of clothing into evidence and to test them. To test them. None of that was done, the testing obviously. Then we hear from Officer Herrera with the New Mexico State Police our second law enforcement agency on scene. Officer Herrera described how when he went out to the scene, he did some preliminary investigations. We see the photos that were taken. We see the evidence markers. And we see some trajectory rods. What we don't see, though, is a complete shooting reconstruction. The state never did that. They have people. They have a whole Department of Public Safety that could have done a shooting reconstruction. Why didn't they do it? Instead, it was left to the defense. We had to hire a shooting reconstruction expert, Aaron Rudenow, and ask him to try to piece together the scene based upon what had been collected by the state police and by the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office. 
a lot more could have been done at the scene, and it wasn't. And ladies and gentlemen, I would submit to you that the reason the state didn't do a complete shooting re reconstruction is because it wouldn't have helped their case. Because once we saw the complete shooting reconstruction, we see that it actually proves Mr. Cummings is telling the truth. I apologize, I should have gotten this set up before I started. So what we see once we finally do a shooting reconstruction is a scene that is chaotic. A scene with impact sights showing that this gun was on the ground upside down when at least two shots were fired. Who intentionally kills somebody by laying on the ground, turning their gun upside down and shooting? The state seems to be trying to suggest that Mr. Cummings could have done that after he shot Mr. Ariola. Again, could have, could have, without an answer is reasonable doubt. It's also ridiculous, quite frankly. And you heard Mr. Brudenell explain why that scenario was incredibly unlikely. He would have had to have pretty much laid across the body in order to achieve that. And as the state pointed out in their own closing, there was no blood on his clothes. So how is he laying across Mr. Ariola's body when he's lying there bleeding out, shooting this gun off at this incredibly odd angle and location and not getting any blood on him? Again, this is just sheer speculation by the state. <sighs> Moving on, our case agent, Lieutenant Tomlinson. Lieutenant Tomlinson oversaw this entire investigation from his office. He never went to the scene. He never bothered to order the testing of Mr. Cummings' clothes. He never bothered to have the gun tasted, uh, tested for traces of mace. He never even bothered to speak with Carlos Herrera. Instead, he went before the grand jury and he testified to a series of statements that were not true. <clears throat> he then comes in here t and testifies before you all and explains that he was in a coma last year and therefore he can't remember his grand jury testimony. But he can remember the details of his investigation just a few weeks earlier. And whether he can remember his the grand jury testimony, whether he can remember the investigation or not, doesn't really matter because the fact that he may have been in a coma a year ago doesn't explain his lack of investigation two and a half years ago. It doesn't explain his grand jury testimony two and a half years ago. We also heard from Dr. Gerald at the Office of the Medical Investigator Dr. Gerald is a professional. She is a forensic pathologist. She comes in here and testifies as to the facts as she sees them. What she did not do was testify that Mr. Ariola was on his knees. She did not testify that the shooter was over Mr. Ariola. In fact, she said she doesn't know where the gun was. She's not gonna speak to where the shooter was. All she could testify to is the trajectory of the wounds and basically the toxicology resort results. She told you, she also never, she never testified that Mr. Ariola would have dropped that can of mace when he was shot. There was never any testimony about that. That is all the state. Spinning the facts to suit their, their needs. 
What Dr. Gerald did testify about that is important, I think it's very clear why it's so important now, is the fact that Mr. Ariola was intoxicated. He was a .118. For context, the legal limit for driving while drinking is a .08. So Mr. Ariola was over the legal limit for alcohol at the time of his death. And he was, on, he had, was using cocaine and that the cocaine and alcohol were used close enough in time that it actually combined to create a different substance called cocaethylene. Cocaethylene in the body can increase aggression and risk taking. She testified to all of that. And then we heard from the state's DNA analyst, Ms. Otto. Ms. Otto testified that Dean's DNA was found on the gun. Of course it was found on the gun. That makes sense. It's his gun. He never denies handling it. She also testified that when they tested the gun, when they're swabbing it, looking for DNA, they didn't swab the scope at all. They didn't swab the muzzle at all. All of their swabbing was focused down here which is consistent with what Mr. Cummings was saying, where he was holding the gun and where Mr. Ariola was grabbing for the gun. Mr. Ariola was grabbing for the gun here and here, ripping the cap off the scope. So no wonder they never found Mr. Ariola's DNA on this firearm. They didn't test the right places. Mr. Cummings' DNA is never found on the mace canister. And by contrast, this is small. This is compact. Ms. Otto testified that when they would swab something like this, they would have swabbed the whole can. They were able to get all around it because it's small compared to this. And Mr. Cummings' DNA isn't on here. Mr. Ariola's is, of course, because. As we now know, Mr. Ariola loved his can of mace. We also heard from Mr. McCullough and Christine Landers. Mr. McCullough came in and he told you what happened that day to the best of his memory. Testified that Mr. Cummings was pretty shook up. We have no dispute with what he testified to. Ms. Landers, you heard her testimony. You will ultimately be the judges of credibility. Ms. Landers, it appeared that she was looking for a quick buck. She wanted this real estate contract signed quickly. She didn't want to bother with other agents or allowing Mr. Cummins, Cummings the opportunity to speak with a lawyer. She wanted him to sign that contract that day, right away. She was even annoyed that he read the contract. She didn't even want him to read her contract and she certainly wouldn't give him a copy of it. She also claimed she knew Mr. Ariola for over 20 years. Apparently she didn't know the same Mr. Ariola that everyone else did. Because let's, let's talk about some of the people who really knew Guillermo Ariola. Debbie Dominguez and Joe Chavez. And remember, these are people that don't know Mr. Cummings, never met him before. They came in here yesterday and they talked to you about the real Guillermo Ariola. How they were both mates. Multiple members of their family were maced. No die in that mace. He even maced their dog. And then you hear from Mr. Klinger. Mr. Klinger, who doesn't really know anybody. Doesn't know anybody. He was just there to buy some medical equipment. Mr. Klinger's only connection is the fact that he had done a couple of transactions with Joe Chavez for some 
sounds like some kind of medical dev uh, devices or some insulin because they both were diabetic. And he testified that he had just pulled up to the gate and was waiting to be let in when all of a sudden Mr. Ariola comes up and starts attacking his car with a hammer. A hammer. Never met the guy before in his life and Mr. Ariola breaks out his tail light and is banging the hammer all the way down mm -hmm. the side of his car. He gets out to say, what are you doing? And Mr. Ariola holds the hammer back and says, I'm gonna F you up. That is the real Mr. Ariola. Unfortunately, that's the Mr. Ariola that was out at the ranch that day. That's the Mr. Ariola that attacked Mr. Cummings. Mr. Chavez made a statement while he test when he testified yesterday that, I that really struck me. And I'd submit to, the to you, ladies and gentlemen, to consider this. Mr. Chavez said that Mr. Ariola was only aggressive when he was drunk. But that, he, or when he was intoxicated. But he was intoxicated every day. That is the Mr. Ariola that attacked Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings got on the stand and testified and told you all what happened. He also told 911, he told Mr. McCullough, he told the police when they arrived on scene, and he told you that he acted in self-defense. Can't see this too well, but you will be able to see it when you go to deliberate, this will go back with you. This is the instruction for self-defense. And what I want to point out to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that the burden is on the state to prove by a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act in self-defense. The burden is on the state. It's not on us. We don't have to prove he acted in self-defense. They have to prove he did not. But ladies and gentlemen, I would submit to you that not only did we prove beyond a reasonable doubt, we proved beyond all possible doubt that he acted in self-defense. Let's talk about what the evidence shows there. Mr. Cummings described for you when he testified the relationship that he had with Mr. Ariola. He described that they got along pretty well. They spent a lot of time talking about the ranch. They went horseback riding together. They even spent a night drinking whiskey. Of course, it was the night that the two of them were drinking whiskey that he started to see some red flags with Mr. Ariola when Mr. Ariola started to share stories about his neighbors. Now we can see why Mr. Cummings would have been a little bit apprehensive about getting crossways with Mr. Ariola after hearing the stories about those neighbors. But Mr. Cummings tried to continue to get along with Mr. Ariola because he wanted to buy that property. He really wanted to get that land and he wanted to build his, his home and his guiding company. He had no motive to kill him. Killing Mr. Ariola kills the land deal. So the state cannot present to you any sort of a motive for why he would have killed him. And you don't have to take Mr. Cummings' word on how things happened that day because the physical evidence actually does show you that he acted in self-defense. First, starting out in the kitchen, the state's trying to direct your attention over to like the living room area and saying there's no sign of a struggle in the living room. Well, of course there's not a struggle in the living room. We all have heard the struggle never happened in the living room. I don't know why they keep trying to direct your attention there. 
But what we do see are Mr. Ariola's sunglasses laying on the floor right at the location where Mr. Cummings said this all started. Right where he was attacked for the first time, right here next to this counter. And he's described for you when the very first time Mr. Ariola attacked him, he went down on the floor. He didn't go flying over to the stove. He didn't go across the room to the living room and start tearing that up. No, he went into the hallway. And he described for you how when he went down, his firearm happened to be sitting right about there. His firearm that he was preparing because he was going to go hunting. And when Mr. Cum uh, Ariola attacked him and was over him, he grabbed the firearm away from him, grabbed it away from the wall in an attempt to defend himself. And he described for you how the fight went down the hall, how he was knocked down again by the bathroom, and he tried to get up, and he did get up, and at that point in time, he held the rifle and pointed it at Mr. Ariola and said, stop. He was trying to stop this attack, but Mr. Ariola didn't stop. And the state's arguing that's not what a reasonable person would do. That is correct. That's not what a reasonable person would do. But what we all know now is that Mr. Ariola wasn't always a reasonable person, especially when he was drunk and on cocaine. Far from being reasonable. The fight continued into the bedroom, and we hear about how he was tackled again. Tackled again for a third time in the doorway of that bedroom. And what do we see? What do we see there? The state says there's no physical evidence of any sort of a, of a struggle. What do we got right there? We've got a propane heater knocked off the wall. We see the brace that holds that heater up. Knocked off the wall, laying on its side in the bedroom. What is that if not signs of a physical struggle? And then the struggle continues in the bedroom. And as we've already heard, ample testimony, and we've seen the impact shots. Two shots go off with the gun upside down on the floor completely indicative of a physical fight over that gun. A struggle for the gun that's going to result in one person living and one person dying. Mr. Cummings did not want to be the one who died. A physical fight where Mr. Cummings is retreating away from Mr. Ariola back into that tiny bedroom. And the state's going to make a big thing about how small that bedroom is. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, that makes it all the more credible that Mr. Cummings would feel in danger for his life. He wasn't in some big room that he could retreat even further, which by the way, the law in New Mexico is that you do not have to retreat. You can stand your ground. But despite that, he did keep retreating. All the way down the hallway, he kept retreating until he gets to this tiny little room where he can't go any further. He can't go any further. He is trapped in that room with a crazed man attacking him over and over again. And you can see the rug pushed up, bunched up, to where Mr. Cummings couldn't go any further. He had nowhere else to go. The gun is already going off. It's already shooting stuff all over the place. It's already, the gun's already been shooting bullets all over the place. As you hear from Mr. 
uh, Mr. Uh, Rudinell, it was a chaotic scene. We have at least three different angles of gunshots at that scene, indicative of a struggle. And finally, what we have in this photo, you can see where the scope cap was ripped off the rifle and ends up under Mr. Ariola's body. Ripped off under his body. That's critical. That is completely consistent with what Mr. Cummings described as how Mr. Ariola was pulling on that gun, trying to pull it away from him, pulling on the scope. And he's pulling so hard that it doesn't just tear the cap off, but there is electrical tape to make it even more secure. And it breaks the cap. It breaks the cap and lands under the body. And finally, what do we find in Mr. Ariola's hand? A canister of mace. The state is trying to make a big issue out of the fact that Mr. Cummings was describing it as a poison. Maybe he called it a poison. Neurotoxin, chlorophyll. If Mr. Cummings had planted the mace in Mr. Ariola's hand, wouldn't he know what it is? Wouldn't he say there was mace in his hand? Instead, he's describing it all these different ways because he doesn't know what it is. All he knows is that there was something black and hard that he was being attacked with over and over and over again. Because we know now, Mr. Ariola liked to attack people with mace. Now let's talk about Mr. Cummings' behavior after the shooting. Mr. Cummings immediately ran out, washed his face, washed his hands, still burning. That's consistent with the testimony we've heard that water isn't a good way to treat mace. He didn't know that. So he ran inside and got some soap, came out and continued to wash his face. Took a while for the burning to stop. But once the burning stopped and once he could breathe again, what did he do? Ladies and gentlemen, I would submit to you that every action Mr. Cummings took after the shooting are the actions of an innocent man. We're out in the middle of nowhere. There's nobody around this ranch. If he had actually just murdered Mr. Ariola, why didn't he just leave? No one's there. He could just say, I have no idea what happened. Why did he stick around? Why did he wave down Mr. McCullough? Why did he call 911? Why did he wait hours for the police to arrive? Why did he gather up his clothing and put them on the bed of his pickup truck? Why did he put the gun and the magazine on the front porch steps? Why did he do all of that? He did all of that because he acted in self-defense. The state's making an issue out of the fact that he asked Mr. McCullough to be a witness for him. He explained to you why he wanted a witness. He was scared. They were out there in the middle of nowhere. He had just shot a man. He knew that police were gonna arrive because he asked the police to be called and he called the police himself. He knew that when the police came out there, they were going to be on edge. That's reasonable. He knew they were going to have guns drawn on him. So he wanted a witness not only to what had happened at the ranch, but he wanted somebody there to be a witness to the police. And Mr. McCullough was that. Mr. Cummings did everything he could to assist the police in their investigation. 
despite everything he did, the police still didn't do a complete investigation. They gathered the clothes, but they never test them. They take the gun, but they never test it for mace. They never even tested the mace canister. They never even called the, ma the mace manufacturer to ask if this had dye in it. The state's asking you to look at this mace canister and decide that it has some kind of dye in it. There's no evidence of that. And in fact, this looks more like rust than any sort of a dye. And the testimony we've heard from the two people that actually were maced by Mr. Ariola is that the mace he used didn't have dye in it. But regardless, the state could have tested these things. The state actually did do a little bit of testing of the firearm. You heard Mr. Brudenell describe for you how they did some basic firearm testing to make sure that it operated. They tested the gun to make sure it worked. How is that helpful? What does that tell you about this case? Nothing. We already know the gun worked. He just said he had used the gun to shoot Mr. Ariola. So that wasn't in dispute. All that shows you is that the state is capable of doing testing. They just chose not to. Ladies and gentlemen, the state has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Cummings did not act in self-defense. All of the evidence in this case, all the physical evidence, everything that you have seen corroborates Mr. Cummings, corroborates the fact that he was attacked. He was attacked not once, not twice, not three times. Repeatedly, over and over and over again, he was attacked by Mr. Ariola till the point where he was up against almost a wall, he was up against those beds, with this man over him, still coming at him, still coming at him, and that he scrambled up to his feet, and you see from the way the rug is all bunched up right where all of this happened, he's scrambling to his feet, pulling on the gun, and he even tells you how at one point he decided, Dean, if you don't get serious, you're not gonna be a dad anymore. And he then takes his other hand, his left hand that he had been using to block Mr. Ariola's strikes. At that point, he realizes this is it. This is it, I need to get serious or I'm gonna be dead. When that happens, he grabs the gun with his left hand, raises it up, and shoots at Mr. Ariola as he's coming towards him again. The trajectory of those bullets shows that right to left pattern in a downward position that is completely consistent with someone attacking. He was attacking Mr. Cummings at the time he was shot and killed. The state tried to suggest that Mr. Ariola was an old man. He wasn't an old man. He was 47 years old at the time of his death. 47. Younger than Mr. Cummings. Ladies and gentlemen, the state's going to make their rebuttal closing, and then the case goes to you. At that point in time, the power is going to shift. The power that the state has and law enforcement had when they conducted their investigation shifts to you. And then you have the power to review their investigation, review their prosecution. And you have the power at that point in time to take the facts, look at the law, and render a verdict. And I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that all of the evidence in this case points to only one verdict, and that is not guilty on both charges. Thank you. There is 
no future without here. This is a man who seems just now almost. Very dangerous. But he wants you to believe. He wants you to believe. And Ms. Um, Ms. Moss also asked, why would he say it's neuro it was a neurological agent? Why would he say it was poison? Well, I suspect he's figured out. You will recall in Ms. Moss' opening statement, he testified a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, differently than what she said happened. Words matter. And what he said <clears throat> and didn't say also matters. As the state, we always have the burden of proof. We gladly embrace that burden. And I will say, When something doesn't make sense, it's not true. And they don't have to put on a case. But once they do, once he takes that witness stand, the same instruction you use for credibility for the witnesses you use for him. You take into account his truthfulness. Well, <clears throat> I disagree a little bit with Ms. Moss. Nobody can prove 100% or beyond the reasonable, or beyond all possible doubt what happened. That's why that's not the instruction. Because there's only two people that know what happened. Two. The defendant and Mr. I. 
fabulous. And he's not here to say what really happened. Let me tell you, if you want to talk about possibilities and scenarios, we, the evidence doesn't necessarily show what they're saying. that it could have happened, and he could have been, Mr. Audio could have been on his knees. And when he was down here demonstrating, and I think I asked him twice, when you actually shot him, show me, how was the weapon? And by the way, just so no one gets nervous, I was well aware of history. Um, but he was pointing like this. He was pointing out because he had to for the story to make sense, right? Because Mr. Ariola is still trying to, he's still trying to do this. He's leaning over him, straightening him. And he said, you look this. That does not match the evidence. There's no dispute that the two gunshot wounds that killed Mr. Ariola were down, slightly down and to your right. There's no way that if he was coming straight at Miss Ariola was coming straight at the defendant. There is no way that he could have been coming straight on to get this shot and this shot. Wrong side. This shot and this shot. No way. And he's why is the room is small? That's important for a lot of reasons. He's he's scooting back. Explain, if he was scooting back, if he's scooting back and he fell and the defendant certainly didn't indicate that he moved the body, he fell right there, he said, at his feet. There's not even any room and he would have had to have been up higher. And if he was really at his feet, Common sense, ladies and gentlemen. Look at all that blood. You tell me how it would be possible that he wouldn't have gotten blood on himself. On his hands, on his shirt. That room's small. Within feet or inches, depending on where you believe he was when he shot. But we know one thing for sure. We know that the shooter... The defendant had to have been above, or at least the weapon had to have been above, Mr. Adiola when he was shot. That doesn't fit his, his theory. Red herrings. I'm sure y'all know what red herrings are. It's, you know, it's, it's when there's things thrown at you or put in front of you to distract you from what's real. 
You don't look at the things that don't make sense. You don't look at all the times that he told me he couldn't remember. When I would ask him about stuff that he knew clearly didn't make his story work, I don't remember, I don't recall. In fact, I believe he, a total of 22 times. I don't remember, I don't recall. Mr. McCullough said you didn't tell him right away. I don't recall that. Mr. McCullough was you were talking to somebody else and you could the conversation was going. I don't remember that. I don't I don't recall that. Mr. McCullough said, I'm gonna go back to meet the deputies. I'll be right behind you. And, and he said, I'll be right behind you. I don't remember that. The deputies testified, and by the way, just to clarify. Deputy, maybe it was in the inartful way I asked the question, but I believe what I asked Deputy Walker was, were you aware, is it normal to try to get identity of a suspect? Yes. Are you aware that attempts were made? Yes. They're all standing around there together. So he was aware of it. Deputy Crispin said he spent hours and <coughs> what's your name? What's your full name? We need all of your identifiers. We need your dirt date of birth. He says I the defendant says on his testimony, for what? answer again would be because he didn't want them to know their full identity for some reason. I don't know, but he was obstructing the law enforcement. They had no reason to make that up. I mean, if you believe the defendants and, the, and defense counsel, there's a big conspiracy going on between the deputies, the CAD operators, I guess, Remember, he, he called a different agency. He called BIA, okay? He called 13 minutes after when he already knew David McCullough was on the phone back and forth with his wife because the, the calls kept being done. Well, they must have, they must have uh, got those times together, whatever the heck that means. And where was he going when he ran into Mr. McCullough? I don't know. Why would he even put the wet clothes in the back of his truck instead of leaving them there? Why would he put his, this weapon that he had just killed someone with in self-defense in the back of his truck under his clothes? And that was the testimony also of David McCullough. <clears throat> Didn't remember that. No, I don't remember telling him that. And whether he remembers or not, Mr. McCullough remembers, where was he going? And why, all of a sudden, after they went back to the port, the, the, all the, they went back, when Mr. McCullough followed you back to the ranch to see what had happened, propped up against the... Uh, we don't know when he did that. But he did, if you believe Mr. McCullough, who has no reason to lie, then he did do that after he went back and ran into Mr. McCullough. So where was he going to? Fleeing the scene?
Now, again, he doesn't remember, conveniently, that he had uh, this long conversation and, and then turned around to leave. Mr. McCullough said it was about five or ten minutes. Then he turned around like a second thought and said, you know what, I'm in trouble. I need you to come witness the body. Not how somebody who just acted in self-defense against a person that he was supposedly friends with. Yeah, you can say the word devastated. And actually, Officer Walker did not say, he said he didn't remember whether he was devastated. He said devastated. And he pointed out that on the transcript, he said in Ottawa. He did listen to it again. He said, yeah, he said he was devastated. But listen to it. Does he sound devastated? Does he act like he was devastated when he talked to Mr. McCullough? Yeah, Mr. McCullough did say to dispatch, oh, the guy here, he seems, he's fine. He's a little shaken up, but he's fine. He's calm. That's what the testimony was. And then he gets up here and says, well, I was in shock. I was in shock. I was in shock. That's why I couldn't remember anything. I was in shock. So I didn't tell him of this stuff. He was cleared, medically cleared twice that night. And remember, David McCullough just happened to be a retired physician's assistant. Don't you think when dispatch asked him how he was, he would have said, he seems like he's in shock. I think you need to get an ambulance. And don't you think if he was really upset enough, or he was hurt to the point that he had been sprayed with something and he had been injured somehow. Don't you think instead of ignoring the question of do you need medical attention, he would have answered? Unless you want to believe that Officer Crespin was lying about that too. So far, two sworn officers lying for no apparent reason. Instruction on credibility. But first, let's go through these red herrings. Because contrary to what Ms. Moss told you, I was watching the same trial. Believe me. Everything that they talked about, for the most part, is a red herring. And you know why? Because they don't want you to look at what was found at the scene, what wasn't found at the scene, and they don't want you to use your common sense. Because if you use your common sense, I mean, make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, it's the only reason that this alleged encounter with drunk Guillermo on a horse, which came up for the first time when he testified here. Why is that relevant? You know what it's for? To make the victim look like a bad guy, a drunk, a fallen over drunk. That wasn't even at the time of the incident. Why was that relevant? Why did they bring that out? It's a red herring. Fatty liver, he had fatty liver. He must have been an alcoholic. No, Dr. Harold's, Gerald said it could be from other things, obesity, not just obesity, not just alcoholism. And she said alcohol use, not abuse. You know, it's great that the neighbors in this neighborhood frack, frack, frackle or whatever happened there, but the, they can get up there and tell you what happened. But you know, neighborhood disputes especially. There's always two sides. Unfortunately, Guillermo can't come and tell you why he sprayed. If he was thought he was in danger because there was more people around him than he had. And he sure as heck didn't go get a weapon to shoot his neighbors with or to defend himself with.
And if you were paying attention, and I know you were, the times when I would ask him about things that don't make his story make sense, like the time of why didn't you follow Why did you say it was poison and not like neurological gas? You never said that. I'm, 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 I'm saying that. Why did you, for two hours, refuse to get your correct DOB? Why did you do that? Why did I do that? And really, uh, the two different magazines. He said he had a lot of magazines there. He was staying there. What is the big deal about two magazines? We know he admitted he even put the weapon there for them to see. The only magazine that matters is the one that was in that gun. And the only two rounds that matters are the two that hit Guillermo in his head and his chest. And that's what he doesn't have an explanation for. He doesn't have an explanation of all the time that went by. He can't account for it. So then he says, well, I can't, I can't remember. I can't remember. The times might have been wrong. Residue or spatter on gun, that's it. Talk about speculation. <laughs> that could have been him washing the blood off the gun. Because if he was that close to Guillermo, he shot and you see the amount of blood that was there. And he was really at his feet. There would have been blood on him. And the reason we ask you to look so carefully at the canister is because it's clear. You don't need an expert to tell you. Look at it. Look at the picture. Look at the picture. It's common sense, ladies and gentlemen. You can see, this is how it was found at the scene. There's no way that canister was sprayed that day. But of course, I don't really know. He never really said whether he was sprayed or not. He was, he wasn't. Was he stuck with it? He was only slanting blow. Maybe he was sprayed on his face and that stung for a while. The mace wasn't sprayed. And there is no explanation for why. If it was happening like Guillermo, like the tenant said, and Guillermo was striking him over and over and over again, why, if you wanted to attack him, wouldn't you turn the mace around? And use the mace. Wouldn't that be a lot more effective than just trying to hit him with this, this light plastic thing? I mean, seriously. Do it to yourself. Seriously. And if, it, if the struggle happened where he said it did when he was first pushed down, he's the one who grabbed that weapon. He's the one that introduced deadly force into this altercation. Not Guillermo. Mace is not a deadly weapon under any interpretation of the definition that you've been given. Not cause of death. There's no reason to believe it would cause death, great bodily harm, permanent or prolonged impairment of an organ. And I suspect that's why after he realized that, oh man, I put that can backwards. I gotta come up with a reason for that. So I suspect that's why the story he came up with was that he was hitting over and over again like this. Doesn't make any sense. It's not reasonable. And I, I say briefly, and I'm not 
going to dwell on it. But I just know sometimes it's easy for jurors to get distracted by things that don't matter. The drama that you might have, tension you might have seen between counsel, it happens in trial. Don't let that impact your decision. Either way, it happens. I have tremendous respect for these two ladies. And they did a hell of a job defending him. But common sense does not go away. Look at how many instructions tell you to look at reasonableness or common sense. The ejection patterns, what would that have told you? There's no alleged encounter with intoxic the horse, the fatty liver, jump. Oh, even some more red herrings today. They want to attack Mr. Walker jumping from agency to agency. What's that about? Doesn't even know when the sun set. Oh my gosh. Shooting reconstruction. That was an incomplete sentence. But here's, here's the real thing, though. To believe that a struggle happened in that little house where Mr. Adiola, for some unknown reason, and I guess they want you to believe that he's drunk all the time, and he's high on coke all the time, and yet he never exhibited this behavior before to them. Your Honor. All right. Apparently, I'm out of time. But here's the bottom line. Here is the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen. you to go back and deliberate with your fellow jurors. And I know you were paying attention and know you took notes. And share your notes. And ask yourselves what makes more sense. Did he act like a person? Whether testimony, action afterwards, what have you. That acted in self-defense as someone he knew that was a friend? Or he act like someone that knew he had killed someone without sufficient provocation and without being faced with deadly force. Thank you. available to you. 
Prior to you beginning your deliberations, you will need to select one of you to act as four person. That person will provide will preside over your deliberation and will speak for the jury here in court. Forms of verdict have been prepared for your use and they read as follows. We find the defendant, Dean Cummings, not guilty of second degree murder as charged in count one of the grand jury indictment. We find the defendant, Dean Cummings, guilty of second degree murder as charged in count one of the grand jury indictment. We find the defendant, Dean Cummings, not guilty of voluntary manslaughter as charged in count one of the grand jury indictment. We find the defendant, Dean Cummings, guilty of voluntary manslaughter as charged in count one of the grand jury indictment. You will take these forms to the, uh, with you into the jury room. The jury room will be this whole courtroom. When you have reached a unanimous agreement as, you, as to your verdict, the four person will sign the forms which express your verdict. You will then return all forms of verdict, these instructions, and any other exhibits to the courtroom. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, I have good news and bad news for two of you. The good news for two of you is you get to go right, go home right away. Uh, well, not right away. I need to explain something to the, the two of you. The bad news is you've been here, you've been here uh, six days or so, and you don't get to decide the case. Uh, the the two jurors that are the alternates are Catherine Maestas and Charles Law, uh, and you are the alternate jurors. And what I need to do, folks, though, is uh, I'm going to have everyone clear. I'm going to tell all 14 of you. Go take about an hour break and come back. When all 14 of you are here, I'm going to release the two alternates. The reason I'm not going to let you go right away is that if something happens to either someone else, uh, then I, I need 12 people to deliver it. So instead of holding you here while we clear this courtroom and the like, I'm going to have you go ahead and take, a, take, a, take an, hour, an hour break. Come back in an hour. Once the 12 of you are present, I'll release the two alternates, and then uh, I'll ask you to start your deliberations, all right? So go ahead and, and be back by, actually be back about uh, 1.15, and then we will take a break. It's already 12, uh, around 1.15, and we will recess early this afternoon for those people who need to go vote. Any questions before we, 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 we break? All right. All right. All right, okay. Until then. Andrea, do you have my cell phone? What's that? I was asking Andrea if she has my cell phone. Um, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, just give me the number. Okay. Okay. One of you. We'll just give it to you again. I know I have Donna's. And then we, we need to go get a, a laptop. Okay. You have to. You can't do it. Take it off, okay? Set it on the floor. 
Right. There's no audio. I'll, I'll unplug it. Yeah, sit on the floor. Okay, take it. Okay. Yeah, we can't use our jewelry room now. I, I understand that. I've seen them lose, I've seen tours lost during the break. Sure.